I saw this wonderful, beautiful, motivating video, a, a Hillary Clinton ad starring the cast of Empire. Watch this. What will I tell my son? What will you tell your daughter? What will we tell the future generation? Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, Freddie Gray, Philando Castile. The violence and nasty rhetoric against mankind is unacceptable. If Trump gets into office, it will only get worse. Hillary has pledged to close the Charleston loophole on guns. I would like a president that will protect Obamacare. Somebody who understands personally the plight of a woman. I want a president who stands up against intolerance. There's only one person in his race who said Black Lives Matter. So many women and men died for us to have the right to vote. Every time we sit out, we dishonor their sacrifices. I'm Gabore Sidibe. And I'm voting for Hillary Clinton. I'm Tasha Smith. I'm Jesse Smollett. I'm Trey Byers. Rashia Gray. Grace Byers. And I'm voting for Hillary Clinton. I'm voting for Hillary Clinton. I'm voting for Hillary Clinton. I'm Taraji P. Henson. I'm voting for Hillary. I'm Lee Daniels, and I'm voting for Hillary Clinton. I got to tell you, people, that was an amazing video. If you don't know the truth about Hillary Clinton. If you don't look into the record, if you don't dig into the background of the Clintons, you would say, wow, that video is amazing. I'm with her too. Well, I'm here to let you know, I'm not with her. The young gentleman, great actor, the guy's on fire. I like his character, I like him. And that's the guy who played Hakeem Lyon. He said that Hillary Clinton is the only one in this campaign that's talking about Black Lives Matters. Well, Trump talked about Black Lives Matter, then he said all lives matter, but we know the deal with Trump. There's been somebody been fighting on the front lines of black issues, Hispanic issues. I mean, not talking about it in a political arena, but actually on the forefront, marching and fighting. And that's Jill Stein, and that's the Green Party. Yes, the Democrats is not the only one that kind of touch with African-American issues. The Green Party is right in the middle of the battle. She's marched with Black Man for Bernie. She's marched um, with different uh, organizations. She's been in the forefront, not just talking, but on the marching field and doing whatever she can to lobby and enact policies without trying to take on a mantle of a politician, but as an activist to help deal with not just black issues, but Hispanic issues, Native American issues. Matter of fact, she has a policy in her platform because she believed it was wrong for blacks to be brought here to build this country and not reward them for it, and because she think it was wrong for Indians to have their land to be conned and schemed from against them, under them, she think that both of them need reparations because the Indians owned the country and the blacks built the country. Her name is Jill Sign. Matter of fact, a lot of people that, that's from the Black Lives Matter organization are running for office under the Green Party ticket. Matter of fact, let me get to this, and this is the point. I hate to tell you, go look at Jill Stein record. Not only does she have a platform to deal with black issues, she have a platform to deal with police brutality. She has a platform that will allow reparations to come to blacks and uh, our Native American Indians because the Native American Indian had their land stolen from them. This is their land. They are the real Americans. And the blacks built this country. So this was the Indian land and the blacks built this country and she believed the blacks and the Indians should have reparations. The only one in this race that's talking about reparation. Now, you're talking about an activist running for office, not a politician, but you don't see Trump out there in the forefront. You're not gonna see Hillary Clinton out there in the forefront, marching and activate, being an activist for black issues. Now, let me get to my point. We're, we're talking about Hillary Clinton. We already know Trump is not Black Lives Matter and he's, you know, matter of fact, he doesn't have a platform to help um, deal with police brutality and things like that. It seems like he's more on the side of the police instead of the side of the community. When Jill is talking about the community overlooking the police versus the police overlooking the community. I'm not here to toot Jill's horn. Go check out our platform, check out our record, go to YouTube, check out our videos. You'll see us speaking at Black Lives Matter, March with Black Lives, you name it. So the proof is in the pudding. Now let's talk about Hillary Clinton, Madam Secretary. Is the only one saying Black Lives Matters? Where was Hillary Clinton? Back in the 60s when she was running with Barry Goldwater, but she was young. It don't matter whether she was young or not. She was old enough to make a decision to help a person campaign for office, but she said that was a mistake. It wasn't a mistake then. 
when she was running, when she was supporting, when she was working for Barry Gowar. I know I should answer the question that is on very many of your minds, and that is, how did a nice Republican girl from Park Ridge <laughs> go wrong? I was a Goldwater girl. I mean, really, we used to wear, you know, little banners which said Goldwater girl. Since I was vocally a Republican and for Senator Goldwater. She supported this guy who was a known racist and was against, was against the Civil Rights Act. Why didn't she stand up against Barry Goldwater and his supporters and say Black Lives Matter? Where was she? Silent. Did Black Lives Matter then? Where was she? Where was she when she was in Arkansas, when she kind of mocked the poor and the lower class of all colors? Where was she when her husband got so frustrated with the fact that these women was coming out talking about having a relationship with him that he got so upset that he flew all the way back to Arkansas to make sure during her pres his presidential run to make sure a black man who was mentally retarded get prosecuted and electrocuted and to oversee that. What about his black life? Why that black life didn't matter? Did it matter to you, Hillary Clinton? No, you didn't do anything to stop it. He was mentally retarded. He didn't know what he was doing. But your husband wanted to make sure he get fried. Why didn't Black Lives Matter when you sitting up here saying that Margaret Singler, the one who pushed to eradicate the black race through abortions, didn't, how can you say Black Lives Matter but yet you hail her as your hero? I have to tell you that um, it was a great, privilege when I was told that I would receive this award. Uh, I admire Margaret Sanger enormously, her courage, her tenacity, her vision. Another of my great friends, Ellen Chesler, is here who wrote a magnificent biography of Margaret Sanger called Woman of Valor. And when I think about what she did all those years ago in Brooklyn, taking on archetypes, taking on attitudes and accusations flowing from all directions, I am really in awe of her. Who used the church, who used the clergy, who used social service leaders, who used um, elite black people to control the black population through abortion all because she didn't want the black race to outnumber the white race. But that's your hero. That's, your, that's somebody who you admire. Somebody who could care less about black lives. Somebody who is a hero to you. Oh, oh, I'm not done. Oh, Robert Byrd, Bob Byrd. Black lives didn't matter to him when he was a Klansman. Today our country has lost a true American original, my friend and mentor, Robert C. Byrd. Senator Byrd was a man of surpassing eloquence and nobility. Robert C. Byrd left such a legacy. An imperial wizard. Oh, but he changed his life in his latter end. How do you know that? You see this person as a hero, even Obama see him as a hero, but you don't know whether he was not involved with the Klan or not. Klan is incognito, a real Klansman gonna sit there and act like they're your cousin, your uncle, your best friend, your co-worker, your boss, or maybe, you, uh, or, or, or uh, come on now. The Klan, some pride in coming out, some still incognito. But that's your hero. But you say, okay, he changed. Bill Clinton, your husband. Stood there and defended that man at his funeral. I can understand you want to say things at great man's funeral, but don't bring the subject of past, present KKK and try to smooth it over. No, he was a Klansman. He hated black people. He, he, he wished black people was dead. And even to the point of 10 years before he died, he called white people niggas. At his elderly age, you say he changed, but you don't really know that. Now, Black Lives Matter. How come black lives didn't matter when you pushed 
for your husband welfare reform bill, which was negotiated as a result of him staying in office to the tenure of his presidency, even though he was impeached. Where did she stand when it came to gutting the welfare um, system, reforming it, and it bit the black community more than help? Where was she when it came to those black lives that matter? You know, when I left law school, my first job was with the Children's Defense Fund. Well, you know, Hillary Fenton's an old friend, but they're not friends in politics. We, we profoundly disagreed with the forms of the, ch of the welfare reform bill. By the time Bill and I left the White House, welfare rolls had dropped 60 percent. You know, many years after that, when many people are pronouncing welfare reform a great success, you know, we've got growing child poverty, the poor are suffering. I'm sorry to say uh, what I thought would happen has happened. This was a blunderbuss. This was just just an axe, a hatchet. Six million, two percent of our population have no income except those food stamps. The food stamps is the is the sole thing that stands between them and and, and being totally without uh, any income. Children who are in need or families. This is a woman who, when her husband was governor, I first met her at that time when I went down to interview him for the Los Angeles Times, and he was starting his presidential run. And they were bragging about their welfare reform, which destroyed uh, what existed of, of support for poor children in, in Arkansas. Then as president, uh, her husband, with her full-throated approval, uh, destroyed the aid to families with dependent children, which 70 percent of the people on that program were children. They destroyed that program. And we, 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 have no, we don't even have an accounting of poor children anymore. They're all, uh, off the radar. When single women or a mother and father who didn't have a job tried to get better education and get better job and join all these job programs, but still couldn't make the bill. And yet, some of them had to do whatever they need to do to survive. And they went into survival mode and some stole, some broke in, some sold drugs, some used drugs. Oh yeah, he threw black people under the bus to get that thing passed, because the Republicans wanted that thing passed, and he sat right there with them to push it, and you helped them, and it really, really damaged the black community, especially young black kids who had no food to eat, no clothes on their back, they were struggling in poverty, and this was the only safety net they had until their mom can get something better. And what it did was put them in survival mode. So this goes to the next bill, and you say Black Lives Matter, but yet you push the bill that put more black men and women in jail than any time in history. Oh, it's not called jail anymore. It's called institutionalized slavery. It's the new plantation. It's just called penitentiary. What happened to Black Lives Matter then? What about the Black Lives Matter when this young man who mom can't put food on the table because mom is probably sick or mom is probably strung out on crack and so he had to go out and get this hustle on because he's not old enough to work so he have to go in and sell drugs to take care of his mama and it may be some weed or maybe he's just frustrated and he's smoking some weed to get his mind off the ills of the street. Or he just hang next to a person who's smoking weed and got weed in his pocket and not only do the police stop him and pat him down and throw him in jail, but he throw him in jail and he had nothing to do with it. Strike one, strike two, strike three, you in there forever. And it built up the prison system and it increased private prisons, which you profited from, Miss Black Lives Matter. What happened to Black Lives Matter then? What was Black Lives Matter when she called her kids super predators? Often the kinds of kids that are called super predators. No conscience, no empathy. We can talk about why they ended up that way, but first we have to bring them to heal. And the Without conscience, and we need to bring them to heal. But first, we, 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 know, we don't understand how they got there, but first, we got to bring them to heal. First, we got to bring them to heal. First, we got to bring them to heal. And this is just a fact. What happened to Black Lives Matter when she met with Black Lives Matter instead of listening to them and hearing their needs and writing it down and considering it, she dictates to them what they should do instead of letting them tell her what she can do for them. So all I'm saying is, your analysis is totally fair. It's historically fair, it's psychologically fair, it's economically fair. 
but you're going to have to come together as a movement and say, here's what we want done about it. Because you can get lip service from as many white people as you can pack into Yankee Stadium and mm -hmm. a million more like it. We're going to say, oh, we get it, we get it, we're going to be nicer, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. That's not enough, at least right. in my book. That's not how I see mm -hmm. politics. So the consciousness raising, the advocacy, the passion, the youth of your movement is so critical. But now all I'm suggesting is, even for us sinners, find some common ground on agendas that can make a difference right here and now in people's lives. And Undermining them. This is Black Lives Matter. What happened to Black Lives Matter when the DCC in the DNC leak or the DCC leak, it states that, look, we'll let you meet with Black Lives Matter. You talk to them, but don't offer no concrete solution to them. In other words, look, we'll hear them out, but we ain't, right now, we ain't thinking about doing nothing, Jack. Oh, and I can go on to policies after policies in different regions, and I didn't even talk about her support with Bloomberg uh, with the Stop and Frisk. Come on, Democrats trying to negotiate a later opportunity to vote on a policy that would help Flint, Michigan, when they should have let the government just go go to zero over this one Flint, Michigan issue that the black people in that community, as well as white people, but majority of black people really need clean water. Let's negotiate a vote later on. We're going to keep the government running and we'll vote later on. We just need you to vote on it. No, you should shut it down and say, no, until we get some aid down there to help those black people that matters, and Hillary Clinton should have been in the forefront of it since black lives matter, but she wasn't. So don't come to me talking about Hillary Clinton is the only one talking about black lives matter. She ain't talking about no black lives matter. And when black lives try to approach her husband, he shut them down instead of listening to them. time black lives matter now before I go two things you got to understand like I said the Republicans right now are using Donald Trump is using the black church to try to garner and support for black people to get them elected with the promise of helping the black community we hear that song all the time Hillary Clinton is doing the same thing she's gonna use black political leaders Black lawyers, black social leaders, going to use them to garner and support to get her into office. And now they're going to use the blacks back and forth as a smear king. The Democrats ain't doing nothing for you. They don't like you. They hate your guts. They're not going to do nothing for you. Come over here with Trump. Oh, Trump is a racist. Don't, don't deal with him. He's just going to send you back to slavery. And both of it is foolishness. Fear tactics is not going to help the black community or any other community. There's no concrete policies. Where are the policies? Where is the promise? Can we get a contract from a presidential candidate saying in my first 90 days, this is what I'm going to do for black people because black lives do matter. Can we get a contract or just we just going to keep getting lip, lip service and black people? Are we going to continue to fall for the same thing that that's been going on for the past since we got an opportunity to vote? It wasn't that long. Less than four, about 40 years ago. When are we going to stand up and realize that they're not going to do anything? They're just using us for our votes instead of the party of the corporations. 
When it comes to Republicans and Democrats, they use black people to get them in office, not going to do jack. It hasn't happened then, hasn't happened yet, and it's not going to happen tomorrow if we keep being dummies and doing it by pushing them into office. Malcolm X call it political cowards. When you continue to sit there and after 40 years of promising, they still have not done nothing, particularly for the black community. And the Republicans saying they're going to do it. Come on, people. The only time black lives going to matter, and I agree with Puffy, is when black community protests this mess. You want to talk about a protest vote, Mr. Obama? Everybody does a protest. A protest vote is when you see the current direction of the company keep going the same direction and nobody's turning around and make it go the right direction or they're lying saying, I got a right direction. It doesn't include your community. Then it should be protested. Go look up the word protest, Mr. President and Mrs. Obama and Mr. Obama. And you'll understand that every vote is a protest vote. Now back to Black Lives Matter and back to the staff of Empire. Nice video. Wrong on every aspect. Hillary Clinton, you, she wants you to be for her, but she is not going to be for you. Not even Obama was for you. He did some things for America, for all of America. Some things he did that was good. Some things he did that was terrible. He's definitely one of the best. I don't think there was not one great president because, well, Abraham Lincoln did whatever he could to stop the slavery of black people. He will always be the greatest in my book. Obama was the president and he's done nothing in particular for the black race. Nothing. He helped Hispanic with the Dream Act. He helped lesbian gays, but nothing for the black people. If Obama didn't push black policies for his own community, he said he's going to do it when he get off. No, you could have did it now just like you did it with the gays and you did it with the Hispanics. If Obama in his two terms didn't push black policy, what make you think Hillary Clinton going to do it? 40 years and the black community have not expanded yet. Sure, we got some good programs because of our tax dollars, but where's the concrete policies? Where are some laws to help black people? Laws. Sanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, but expecting a different result. What we're doing is insane. It's time for a real change. Take your propaganda, turn it sideways, and throw it somewhere. Or stick it somewhere. Because your girl, the only time black lives matter to her is when she needs a vote. Now before I leave, I'm going to leave you a message by Malcolm X. But until black people start showing their vote is too powerful and we're not going to continue to vote for you if you're not going to start doing policies. So we're going to hold back our vote. And the moment we start seeing you put down policies in this election without us, then we'll start giving you our vote. I'm Robert Brown. Black lives matter. All lives matter, but all lives got to include black lives. Listen to the prophetic words of Malcolm X. Why is America, why does this loom to be such an explosive political year? Because this is the year of politics. This is the year when all of the white politicians are going to come into the Negro community. You never see them until election time. You can't blame them until election time. They're going to come in with false promises. And as they make these false promises, they're going to feed our frustrations. And this will only serve to make matters worse. I'm no politician. I'm not even a student of politics. I'm not a re Republican, nor a Democrat, nor an American, and got sense enough to know it. I'm one of the 22 million black victims of the Democrats. One of the 22 million black victims of the Republicans and one of the 22 million black victims of Americanism. And when I speak, I don't speak as a Democrat or a Republican. I speak as a victim of America's so-called democracy.
You and I have never seen democracy. All we've seen is hypocrisy. When we open our eyes today and look around America, we see America not through the eyes of someone who, have, who has enjoyed the fruits of Americanism. We see America through the eyes of someone who has been the victim of Americanism. We don't see any American dream. We've experienced only the American nightmare. We haven't benefited from America's democracy. We've only suffered from America's hypocrisy. And the generation that's coming up now can see it and are not afraid to say it. If, if you go to jail, so what? If you're black, you were born in jail. If you black, you were born in jail. In the north as well as the south. Stop talking about the south. Long as you south of the long as you south of the Canadian border, you're south. Don't call Governor Wallace a Dixie governor. Romney is a Dixie governor. Twenty-two million black victims of Americanism are waking up and they're gaining a new political consciousness, becoming politically mature. And as they become, uh, develop this political maturity, they're able to see the recent trends in these uh, political elections. They see that the whites are so evenly divided that every time they vote, uh, the race is so close, they have to go back and count the votes all over again. And that, 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 which means that any block, any minority that has a block of votes that stick together is in a strategic position. Either way you go, that's who gets it. You're, you're in a position to determine who go to the White House and who stay in the doghouse. You're the one who has that power. You can keep Johnson in Washington, D.C., or you can send him back to his Texas cotton patch. You're the one who sent Kennedy to Washington. You're the one who put the present Democratic administration in Washington, D.C. The whites were evenly divided. It was the fact that you threw 80% of your votes behind the Democrats that put the Democrats in the White House. When you see this, you can see that the Negro vote is the key factor. And despite the fact that you are in a position to, de to be the determining factor, what do you get out of it? The Democrats have been in Washington, D.C. only because of the Negro vote. They've been down there four years. And all other legislation they wanted to bring up, they brought it up and gotten it out of the way, and now they bring up you. And now they bring up you. You put them first and they put you last. Because you're a chump. A political chump. In Washington, D.C., in the House of Representatives, there are 257 who are Democrats. Only 177 are Republicans. In the Senate, there are 67 uh, Democrats. Only 33 are Republicans. The party that you bash controls two-thirds of the House of Representatives and the Senate, and still they can't keep their promise to you, because you're a chump. <laughs> Anytime you throw your weight behind a political party that controls two-thirds of the government, and that party can't keep the promise that it made to you during election time, and you are dumb enough to walk around continuing to identify yourself with that party, you're not only a chump, but you're a traitor to your race. And what kind of alibi do they come up with? They try and pass the buck to the Dixiecrats. Now back during the days when you were blind, deaf, and dumb, ignorant, politically immature, naturally you went along with that. But today as your eyes come open and you develop political maturity, you're able to see and think for yourself. And you can see that a Dixiecrat is nothing but a Democrat in disguise. You look at the structure of the uh, government that controls this country. It's controlled by 16 senatorial committees and 20 congressional committees. 
Of the 16 senatorial committees that run the government, 10 of them are in the hands of Southern segregations. Of the 20 congressional committees that run the government, 12 of them are in the hands of Southern segregations. And they're going to tell you and me that the South lost the war. And the first thing he does when he comes into power, he takes all the Negro leaders and invites them for a coffee to show that he's all right. And those Uncle Toms can't pass up the coffee. They come away from the coffee table telling you and me that this man is all right. Because he's from the South. And since he's from the South, he can deal with the South. And well, look at the logic that they're using. What about Eastland? He's from the South. Make him the president. He can, if, if Johnson is a good man because he's from Texas, and, it, and being from Texas will enable him to deal with the South, Eastland can deal with the South better than Johnson. Oh, I say, you've been misled. You've been had. You're being took. I was in Washington a couple of weeks ago while the senators were filibustering. And I noticed in the back of the Senate a huge map. And on this map, it showed the distribution of Negroes in America. And surprisingly, the same senators that were involved in the filibuster were from the states where there were the most Negroes. Why were they filibustering the civil rights legislation? Because the civil rights legislation is supposed to guarantee voting rights the Negroes in those states. And those senators from those states know that if the Negroes in those states can vote, those senators are down the drain. The representatives of those states go down the drain. And in the Constitution of this country, it has a stipulation wherein whenever the rights, the voting rights of people in a certain district are violated, then the representative who rep who's from that particular district, according to the Constitution, is supposed to be expelled from the Congress. Now, if this particular aspect of the Constitution was enforced while you were in Washington, D.C., <laughs> but what would happen when you were expelled the Dixocrat, you're expelling the Democrat. When you destroy the power of the Dixocrat, you're destroying the power, power of the Democratic Party. So how in the world can the Democratic Party in the South actually side with you in sincerity when all of its power is based in the, in the South? These Northern Democrats are in cahoots with the Southern Democrats. <laughs> They plan a giant con game, a political con game. You know how it goes. One of them, one of them comes to you and make believe he's for you. And he's in cahoots with the other one that's not for you. Why? Because neither one of them is for you. But they got to make you go with one of them or the other. So this is a con game. And this is what they've been doing with you and me all these years. First thing Johnson got off the plane when he became president, he asked, where's Dickie? You know who Dickie is? Richard, Ru Richard Russell. Look here. Yes. Lyndon B. Johnson's best friend is the one who is ahead, who's heading the forces that are filibustering civil rights legislation. You tell me how in the hell is he going to be Johnson's best friend? How can Johnson be his friend and your friend too? No, that man is too tricky. Especially if his friend is still old Dickie. Whenever the Negroes keep the Democrats in power, they're keeping the Dixocrats in power. This is true. A vote for a Democrat is nothing but a vote for a Dixocrat. I know you don't like me saying that. But I, I, I'm not the kind of person who come here to say what you like. I'm going to tell you the truth whether you like it or not. Up here in the North, you have the same thing. The Democratic Party don't, don't do it. Doesn't, they don't do it that way. They got a thing that they call gerrymandering. They, they maneuver you out of power. 
even though you can vote, they fix it so you're voting for nobody. <laughs> they got you going and coming. In the South, they're outright political wolves. In the North, they're political foxes. A fox and a wolf are both canine. Both belong to the dog family. Uh, you take your choice. You're going to choose a northern dog or a southern dog. Because either dog you choose, I guarantee you, you'll still be in the doghouse. I'm Robert Brown. Bob TV, baby, that's me. Freedom on fire. And I'm looking sharp as a tacky, tack, 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 day, baby. I'll see you later.